Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Damon Fordham, and I'm the adjunct professor of history at Charleston Southern University in the Citadel. And I'm the author of three books on, it's not, on local African American history, including one called Voices of Black South Carolina. And in Voices of Black South Carolina, I included a story that's uh, pretty dear to my heart and dear to the hearts of many in this area of a lady who was once one of the great heroines of this area, but is largely forgotten today, which is very unfortunate. And her name was Miss Abby Monroe. When I was a boy, I used to hear a lot of the elders in the community talk about going to a Monroe school. And whenever they would get in an argument, they would say, I'm smart, I went to Monroe school. And that was their way of saying that they were not ignorant, that they knew things. And this was when I was a boy in the late 60s and early 70s. And these elders tended to be one generation removed from slavery. And I kept hearing them talk about this Monroe school and about this lady named uh, uh, Miss Monroe. And of course, at that age, I wasn't quite sure what they were talking about. My father was Abraham Fordham, who was a teacher at the old Lang High School from 1950 to 1974. And he also was somewhat of an amateur historian and that he was one of those village sages who knew a lot about the town's history even though none of it, especially of the black community at that point, had been written down, or so I thought. So one day I asked him, where was this Monroe school? So, I, so, I, so dad laughed and he said, well, son, that wasn't actually the name of it. It wasn't actually Monroe school. What it was was that there was, it was actually Lang School. And Lang was named after Henry Lang, who was a treasurer of an organization that dealt with the improving the condition of the newly freed people, you see? The Friend Society, it was a Quaker organization. And that was started in, 19, in 1866. They had a principal named Abby Monroe, and everybody around here loved the ground that woman walked on. Now, so I said, so did you know this Miss Monroe? She's like, no, 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 she was before my time. She died before I was born, but uh, the old people were really fond of her. And I remember hearing about that Monroe school too. I said, oh, okay, that's interesting. So I had, and then I learned that this Abby Munro was white. And I knew that they had segregation those days, but I had no idea that you had black teachers and white schools in those days. But it uh, turned out that that was indeed the case at that point. And as, the case, as was the case with a number of my father's stories, this one really turned out to be true. And then when he passed away, I came across a collection of his papers that he had gotten over the years. And one of them was the centennial yearbook of Lang High School. Dad would tell me in back in the day that at the centennial program in 1966, I was two years old, and that raised such a ruckus that they had to carry me out of the auditorium. A little story that he used to use to amuse me. But in that pamphlet, it's mentioned that the origins of Lang High School Black School of Mount Pleasant during the segregation era had its origins in early 18, 1866 at the Mount Pleasant Presbyterian Church. The white Quaker from New Jersey named Cornelia Hancock was sent to the South by a Quaker organization to start a school for the newly freed blacks. While visiting Mount Pleasant across the Cooper River from Charleston, the story goes that she came across 50 hungry and ravished black children decimated by the effects of the post-Civil War South. She is said to ask the children if they wish to go to school, and they said yes. And after holding some informal classes, she arranged for her organization, the Friends Association for the Aid and, and Elevation of Freedmen, to fund and organize the school. And the school was named after Henry Lang, the treasurer of the organization. Now, in the years immediately following the Civil War, Blacks were allowed to attend schools in the southern states, albeit segregated, for the very first time, in most cases. Since only a handful of privileged, free African Americans had the education to become teachers, they, used to they basically had white teachers by and large until the day would come when African Americans would be able to replace them. Now, there's a book called The South After Gettysburg, Letters of Cornelia Hancock in which Cornelia Hancock's writings have survived. And 
According to these letters, the school made considerable progress in its early years. The students initially learned the basics of counting and the alphabet, and by 1868, they were drawing crowds for spelling bees. The local black community supported the school through what they grew on farms in their gardens. And it's a little known historical fact that the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, the black regiment from the movie Glory that, uh, that was popularized in the film with uh, Morgan Freeman and Denzel Washington some years ago, the 54th Massachusetts Regiment would also informally teach the students and give, have them do the spelling bees and such. So they all, Ms. Cancock also opened a night school for the adults in the community, which is an absolute necessary. Many of the elders in the black community in those days wanted to read for two reasons. Many of them wanted to learn the Bible, and others wanted to learn to avoid being cheated during the early days of sharecropping and the like. And many sent their children to school with a, with a vigor, primarily so that the children could he prevent them from being cheated in deeds, wills, and that sort of thing. Well, on the other hand, while she was known for being benevolent in that matter, these letters reveal an other side to Miss Cornelia Hancock. You see, the letters show that he had, she had somewhat of a difficult personality. She despised the white Southerners, for one thing, and the feeling was mutual. As many Southern whites felt that, what, that uh, the education of young black pupils would basically make them eventually superior to them, and of course they didn't want that, number one. Secondly, many felt that the education of newly freed blacks would ruin their pool of cheap labor. And that's a key thing to understand here. And in fact, one of the worst segregationist governors of South Carolina, Coleman Bleese, he made an infamous statement once where he said that if you educate a n, you get the idea that you would ruin a good field hand. So in many parts of South Carolina, black schools were burned and white teachers were sometimes lynched and flogged. That did not happen in Mount Pleasant. However, Miss Cornelia Hancock was largely ostracized by the white community. However, while local African Americans appreciated her work, her letters often contained pointed reference to the, quote, ignorance and laziness of her charges without the understanding of the mental consequences of slavery. And by that, I mean, obviously, if you are enslaved and you are working for somebody else for no pay, that's not going to entice you to be the most productive. You're going to do what you can to get as much out of it for yourself and not the slave owner that you're working for, by and large. And so then she went on to say that, uh, on some, say that one black lady who was assigned to clean her house found her so difficult and demanding that she quit her job. One letter quotes her as saying that the local African Americans were so lazy that they would let a tree branch stand in the middle of the road a long time before even thinking to move it out of the way. So needless to say, this was a very difficult situation in its early period. And around 1869, Cornelia Hancock retired due to poor health. And they had another white teacher to come in to take her place to run the school. This was Miss Abby D. Monroe of Bristol, Rhode Island, who was selected to take her place. She was born in 1837 and taught in the public schools of Rhode Island, but her physician advised her that the climate of the South would be better for her health. And arrangements were made for her to replace Miss Hancock. Now, like many teachers of her time, she never married and dedicated her life to teaching. And in those days, they had laws preventing married teachers from teaching. One reason that I was given by someone who was old enough to remember that was that if the teachers became pregnant, it would make the children, quote, ask questions, as if the children didn't see that in their home to begin with, right? Yeah, makes sense. So anyway, the letters, the records and testimonies from that time indicate that Abby Monroe had an empathy toward African Americans that was rare for her era. As she ventured toward her assignment in Charleston, she recorded her thoughts about coming to the South in the aftermath and the Civil War of her diary on January the 16th, 1869. 
Oh, what a long, dreary ride through miles and forests and swamps over muddy waters or past miserable-looking villages of Negro huts. No sign of life or thought. Everything all through the South has such a forsaken, desolate look, and the people seem but half alive as they shuffle rather than they walk along. And what but slavery has done this? So this shows that she had a lot of insight to not only looking at what she saw in face value, but she also understood the causes of what she saw. And that was key with her empathy toward the black community at that time. Ms. Monroe saw another tragic example of the effects of slavery upon her arrival. In one of the rude huts that she described, she happened to fall upon an elderly slave formerly known as Old Hannah. And as she walked past Old Hannah's home, which Ms. Monroe described as a small, dark, damp, and dismal place, she heard someone singing. Upon greeting Old Hannah, who was the sole res resident of this abode, Ms. Monroe noted that Hannah was, quote, greatly crippled through the loss of one limb, and that the lines of care and sorrow were furred deep, so deep upon the black, wrinkled face. When asked about her leg, Old Hannah explained that many years earlier, her limb had been broken from abuse by her former slave master. The injury was left untreated for so long that a doctor later amputated her leg above the knee. In spite of this infirmary, the former enslaved lady replied, I thank the Lord that I have but one foot left. Since this was Miss Monroe's closest encounter with slavery up to that time, she, asked the side, she decided to ask the older woman about her background. Old Hannah went on to say, I come right from Africa. I remember when the white man steal we, as she said in her Gullah dialect. She recalled that she and her brother's sister were playing in the field when two white men captured them and brought them to the ship on the big water. A storm came and the big waves dashed over the vessel and the ship rocked like a cradle. Her sister became sick and was thrown overboard in the sea. Once they landed in America, she was separated from her brother doing a slave sale, and the siblings never saw each other again. In spite of this pathos-filled tale, old Hannah lifted up her arms and said that there was a better home up there in heaven. No more hunger, no more thirst, land flowing with milk and honey, and plenty big plates full of food. After hearing her story, Miss Monroe commenced with her duties in teaching, not at the Lang School at first, but at the Avery Institute for a brief period. And a couple of months went by before she found time to check upon her formerly enslaved friend. When she did, Miss Monroe noticed that, her, that the hut was now closed and empty. And quote, old Hannah had exchanged the humble abiding place for a home not made with hands eternal in the heavens. And Abby Monroe was an abolitionist prior to all of this, prior, during, prior to the Civil War and so forth. And she had but an intellectual empathy toward African Americans, but her actual contact with them was limited. But this particular incident put, really made her want to do something to be of assistance to these people. Now, while some of what she said at the time may sound patronizing to some today, Considering that these were the days in the post-Reconstruction era when the Klan was very prevalent in South Carolina and lynchings and race riots were common. In fact, during the time Abby Monroe was in Mount Pleasant, there were race riots in 1880, 1876 and in 1888, as well as one major one in Charleston on November the 8th, 1876 on Broad Street. But yet she had, but yet her feelings toward them were far advanced for someone of that time period, of that place and time period. So then when she went to Lang, she built upon the solid foundation that Cornelia Hancock left behind on most accounts. The original building was destroyed by the Great Charleston Earthquake of 1886, but was rebuilt shortly afterward. And by 1893, the school was given a deed to a similar Quaker organization called the Pennsylvania Abolition Society of Philadelphia, for whom Treasurer Henry Lang and Abby Monroe once worked. The school expanded to six grades by the 1890s. 
And it's important to understand that because 12 grades were not required in South Carolina schools until 1948, which says a lot about the quality of the schools at the time. And along with courses of cobbling, trades, and clothes makings, she also, she also tried to see to it that African-American graduates of the school would eventually become teachers. Among the earliest were Martha Gathers and Mary Jones. As it was not yet a public school, pupils were charged 25 cents a month. Smaller students, small students would often pay 20 cents. And according to the records, the school averaged about uh, 300 or so pupils per year. Now Mount Pleasant resident Betty Lee Johnson in the, 19, in the 1970s interviewed a lot of elderly residents of the town for the East Cooper Pilot newspaper that we had back in the 19th, back during that period. And later on in 1987, she compiled her interviews with these elders in a, book, in a pamphlet called, As I Remember It, An Oral History of the East Cooper Area. And these reminiscences are of extreme importance because, um, a, because a lady by the name of Royal wrote a history of Mount Pleasant in 1960. But beyond that, there was not a whole lot out there. And, many of the, and so the, many of these people that uh, Betty Lee Johnson interviewed, they were people who grew up in the immediate post-Civil War period up to about the 1920s. And these are often the only records we have of Mount Pleasant history up to that time, and that generation is completely vanished. So the volumes one and two of the As I Remember It, an oral history of the East Cooper area is a valuable resource for anyone wanting to look on Mount Pleasant history, and much of it is isn't today online. But anyway, what they, a couple of the residents that she interviewed talked about Miss Abby Monroe. One made a passing reference about uh, a Celia Brown recalled in a passing reference about uh, going to a, as Betty Lee Johnson called it, a Monroe School phonetically, but she meant Monroe School. But then she also spoke to a lady who was a great pillar in the African American community well into my boyhood, Miss Marguerite Gib Gibbs Johnson. She was the owner of the Johnson Hall's funeral home. And she died sometime in the 1990s when, uh, when she was almost 100 years old. She was born in 1902, and she was well active. She was active well into the 1980s and early 90s. But she spoke to Betty Lee Johnson in part about attending the quote unquote Monroe School of the early 1900s, and this is what she had to say. Abby D. Monroe was very strict. Every week we had to memorize a Bible verse when it came to Friday. And by Friday, you would better know it, including what book and verse it was from. Miss Monroe would sit there, and she would always stern looking, but she was kind. We had a Dorcas clothes making society here, and the Quakers would send down barrels of clothing. Miss Monroe also ran a boarding house for colored teachers on Benning Street. She ran an orphan's home, too, at the corner of Benton Benning Streets, and she saw to it that they were well trained and several of the orphans went on to become teachers. Now, the orphan's home that Ms. Johnson referred to was the Mount Pleasant Home for Destitute Children that Ms. Monroe formed in July of 1883. Most people who are knowledgeable about South Carolina's black history know about the Jenkins Orphanage founded by uh, the Reverend Daniel J. Jenkins in downtown Charleston, primarily because of that orphanage's history with the jazz band. However, that was formed in 1891, and Miss Monroe formed this orphanage in July of 1883. And like as with the Jenkins Orphanage, it had its origins when Miss Monroe found a barely clothed eight-year-old black girl at her door begging for food and shelter during a storm. Upon learning that the child had been orphaned for the last two years and was badly bruised from abuse, she managed to get help for the child via friends from Philadelphia. Not long after this, she learned of a family of 10 whose father had been driven from a rural area for, quote, political persecution. Let's look into that for a moment. This was at a time when African Americans were voting during the Reconstruction era, prior to the rise of the racist groups such as the Red Church, which was somewhat of a Klan offshoot, and when Benjamin Tillman became the senator in 1895, he 
took away what remaining voting rights African Americans had. So there's still a lot of racial violence going on at this point. The mother was dead, and the only belongings the family possessed were a bundle of rags carried by one of the boys. Monroe eventually found a home for this family, and that led to the incorporation of the orphanage. In a pamphlet designed to raise funds for the orphanage, Ms. Monroe revealed an understanding of what led to the condition such children faced. And she said, and I quote, more than a million colored children in the southern states are growing up in ignorance and vice. For the most part, they are orphans of children of destitute parents whose destitution, vagrant life, depraved habits, and raggy, filthy condition exclude them from the ordinary restraints of society. They form a class from which the ranks of crime are continually recruited. No asylums are provided for these homeless, neglected weights thrown upon the street by the tide of corruption or poverty created by the system of slavery. And that's important because oftentimes people use those type of conditions to say that black people were inferior and use that as propaganda to justify their oppression. Abby Monroe on the other hand said, no, no, no. We have to look at what caused this and instead of persecuting these people, we have to do something to help cure it. And that's a key thing here. But one of the really important legacies of Miss Abby Monroe was to create an organ that preserved a lot of not only the history of African Americans in Mount Pleasant, but also provided a voice for the people of that time. It also provides us with great historical insight on what was happening not only with the school, but of her pupils. And that is the Lang School Visitor. She formed the newspaper in 1898. And she wanted to, and the children, students sometimes provided letters and articles, and Abby Monroe wrote about her observations along with these. And the, by reading the papers, its primary goal was to raise funds for the school and to show them that they were making progress. But it provides us with such interesting tidbits of, South, of Mount Pleasant's black history that would have otherwise been vanished and forgotten. And I'm going to share with you some insights from that. In one section, she talks about the she talks about a Mr. Montgomery, who claimed to visit who came to visit roughly around January of about December of 1900, and they had a 32 a 32nd annual entertainment. In other words, they basically had a little party going on, and they brought and a gentleman by the name of Mr. Montgomery brought a gramophone to the school, which was the early form of the phonograph. Now, of course, many of the children had never seen what we would now call a record player before, and, and it's interesting to hear their reflections on that. This was the best time we ever had yet. It was so funny. I didn't know how what to make of it when I heard the band play and the men sing and laugh and through that horn. When the music began to play, I almost jumped out of my seat. I was so scared, and I says to myself, what is this thing anyhow? that sing so sweet without any mouth and play music without any hand. That was a great treat. I most say I could not talk, stop talking about that graphophone, as she put it. She tended to write these things phonetically, you see. I tell my cousins Elijah about it, and he said he was very sorry his mother stopped him from school. I tell all of my friends about the good time we had. Now, the fact that she mentions his cousin Elijah, ha mother having to stop him from going to school, is one common refrain that we see in a lot of these early letters. And I'm going to get into that deeper very shortly. But along with things like that, she also provided the students, she also provided the students with histories of people who they considered important. One particularly interesting article has a Union Army general coming to the school and telling the students all about John Brown. And for those of you who don't know the story of John Brown, it's kind of interesting that that would be celebrated there back in, uh, back in 1900. And here's what I mean by that. John Brown was the white abolitionist who led violent raid in Kansas against slavery. And he was most famous for in uh, 1859, he led a raid on Harper's Ferry in Virginia with 17 whites, including his sons, and five African Americans, including a black man from Charleston named Shields Green, 
they were, they were, their goal was to raid the armory at Harper's Ferry and get guns to start a slave rebellion in the South. However, they were captured by two generals and eventually executed. The generals, by the way, would have an interesting future. Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee, who would later, of course, become major generals for the Confederacy. And so John Brown was hanged on December the 2nd, 1859. Now, to many African Americans and anti-slavery people, he was a martyr. But to much of the white South, he was a bloodthirsty, thirsty fanatic and a mass murderer. And that Abby, that Abby Munro would put, would write glowingly about this in a paper in the black, in a black, in the black Southern community in 1900, says a lot about where she was mentally. And one of the teachers, a Miss Carrie Gilliard, made a did a recitation at Friendship AME Church in Mount Pleasant by about Richard Allen, the founder of the AME Church, who back in 1786, he and his uh, fellow black congregants at the St. George Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia were refused communion by the uh, white rectors of the church. And they stormed out of their church and formed their own church, Mother Bethel, which they later organized in 1816 as the African Methodist Episcopal Church, also known as the AMEs. And so that Abby Munro would uh, publish this in the paper serves as a serves as a great service to the young people in that in that school at that time, because black history books were very much scarce at that period. There was one written by George Washington Williams. The, story of the history of the Negro in the United States from 1619 to the present, and Booker T. Washington would not write story of the Negro until for another eight or nine years or so. So this was a major service to, the, to her, to the community. And one really interesting story in the paper deals with a, a very obscure figure in, hist in African American history. She did a story in the uh, March 1913 edition called Up From Slavery, and it goes as follows. Wrapped in meditation, and a, a, patri a patriarchal black man may often be seen sitting at the stout steps of the St. Louis courthouse. When asked the reason of his preoccupation, he will reply, on these steps I was sold for $50 65 years ago. By one of the most fairy tales of emancipation, this $50 slave James Milton Turner by name arose to be a prime minister to a, a prime minister general to Liberia turn Liberia excuse me with the rank of a, of a of council general in the army he became the friend of king edward the 7th of bismarck and emperor wilhelm of germany through his marvelous ability he and his legal partner stand today to win a million dollars fee in the Indian land cases out in Oklahoma. Now, the point of all of this is that the media of that time basically pictured African Americans as degraded creatures, by and large, deserving of segregation and discrimination. And so for her to put stories like that in the paper would serve to inspire the children of the possibilities of what they can become. And one of the really fascinating aspects of this would be the letters that the students would write to Miss Munro that would be put in the paper. And here are a few of them. I am accomplished some good here for my people in the future days to come, but I can't give up the great desire I feel to attend school and become further perfected in my studies. And this is a young man in Murrett Hall, South Carolina, who was a former student of hers who's now teaching. The colored people here is very poor, and the young people is very ignorant because they have had such little time at school. I feel very thankful for what little education I has got myself, but I can't stop here. I must go on and accomplish more learning before I die. I have some cotton planted for myself, and if I could sell it, I shall try and go to school next winter. There is not hardly anybody here who can read and write. I feel more anxious for them than I can express. I am doing all I can for them that the country school has only three months open and their condition is not sufficient enough to pay a teacher. I tries to remember all the good thing, teaching I got at your school, all about temperance and such good advice. I wish my brothers and sisters could go to your school. 
please write me a letter because I need your good encouragement. Yours truly, Charles D. Green. That speaks for itself. Now, the Lang School was the only school for blacks in the Mount Pleasant area for many years, and students would often walk as many as seven to 10 miles from the rural areas to attain the education. Unfortunately, many students could not attend, not only because of distance, but also because the intense poverty of most of the people forced the children to work or provide assistance to their families. Letters such as the following appeared frequently in the Lang Visitor. March 1902. My dear teacher, I will have to stop school to help my mom. She says she thinks I learned well this winter and I will try to do better when I can come to school again because I want to go to your school and learn to be a teacher myself. I will have to work to help myself because my ma is very poor, but I means to try. I like to read the book I got Christmas and I thank you for it. When work is done, I will come back to school. Your scholar, MLD. And uh, one of the most fascinating series of letters that were stapled this newspaper was from a young man named Benjamin J. Jones. After graduation, he attended the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama under the leadership of the famed educator Booker T. Washington. For those who don't know, Booker T. Washington was born in slavery in Malden, West Virginia in 1856 and was old enough to remember emancipation. And when he was a small boy, he was astonished to see a black man in his village reading a newspaper, and that inspired him to go to school. So he literally walked 450 miles from Malden, West Virginia, to Hampton, Virginia, to obtain an education at the Hampton Institute. And he was later sent to Alabama to start the Tuskegee Institute, and became not only the best known black educator of his day, but went on to become a major spokesperson for many black people, and was the first to dine with the president, Theodore, D. Ro Theodore Roosevelt, under much controversy. As a matter of fact, Senator Benjamin Tillman, the architect of Jim Crow, South Carolina, said that it would take killing a thousand more <clears throat> before that blacks learned their place again after, Booker, after Theodore Roosevelt entertained that <clears throat> in the White House. These were the, this is the type of conditions that these students were up against. But anyway, in November of 1899, uh, Benjamin G. Jones, J. Jones had this to say to Abby Monroe in the Lang Visitor newspaper. I was one happy boy when Professor Booker T. Washington told me you got a scholarship for me so that I could enter the day school. I will go on with my trade just the same, working one day a week on Saturdays. I will study harder than ever because I have a first class advantage. Professor Booker T. Washington is away a great deal, but there are many teachers to carry on the work in his absence. I am well and happy as a, sun, a big sunflower. I hope you will one day see that I have improved my advantages and have made a man out of myself, which says a lot about mentorship. After Jones graduated, he became a teacher in Strawberry, South Carolina in rural Berkeley County on the way to Monk's Corner. In February 1905, the following letter appeared from Jones appeared in the Land Visitor. I am trying to do to my best in instructing the children in their lessons from their books and in some of the useful things I have learned myself while at school. Newberry, Strawberry is a town of about 1,000 inhabitants. I have 63 pupils enrolled and the attendance is very good and the children seem very eager to learn. I love to teach them. So with all this going on, however, Abby Monroe did not turn a blind eye to the ugly realities of that time. As a matter of fact, she editorialized this in the, in the January 1904 edition of the Lang Visitor. Last year, the Jim Crow restrictions were placed upon the ferry boats running between Charleston and Mount Pleasant. The company protested against it, and the officials of the boats were greatly annoyed by this and, in fact, have never taken any special plans to enforce it. At one of the, the meetings of the Negro Ministerial Union, the ministers decided that they will not use any of their boats, as they have been in the habit of doing for picnic excursions, but would forego them altogether until such a time as they could have their own conveyance. So they contend themselves with lawn parties and such excursions as they could make them within the limits of the city, at great gain to themselves, 
and, and a loss, as I have been informed, of good authority of $10,000 to the steamboat company, while travel on the boat generally has been greatly diminished. Now, it's interesting to con consider the fact that most people think that protesting against civil rights began with Rosa Parks. And this shows that as early as January of 1904, you had African Americans protesting segregation in their own way by refusing to patronize the people who segregated them and trying to go on and build their own thing instead. So this gives a lot of insight that the people were not as docile as often believed at that time. And fortunately, we have rec records of this kind to prove that point. However, though, Abby Hoffman, real, excuse me, I'm sorry, Abby Munro realized that the day would come when people like her would have to eventually step aside from teaching. In 1913, this came about in one of the, lang in the March 1913 edition. A bill has been introduced in Congress which makes it a misdemeanor punishable by fines for a white person to teach in a Negro school, public or private, in a city or, count or country. As the teachers in all the city schools are, almost without exception, white women, depending, depending upon their own exertions through reduced circumstances and the principles of prominent white men, this bill will not be likely to pass, although it does seem a right thing that colored teachers should teach those of her, their own color. Once it would have hardly seemed possible, but now it would no longer be a difficult matter, as well as been proved, to find teachers to fill all these places aptly and well. In other words, Abby Munro understood that while it was great that she was doing what she was doing for the African American community at that time, she, it was necessary for people like her to do that at the time because there was no one else to do so. But it was really about teaching the African American to help themselves after having been denied the privilege of learning to read or write throughout slavery. And so she wanted to see the day come when they would eventually be able to take, them, take care of themselves. However, she felt kind of homesick. And in, in the latter part of 1913, she went back to Bristol, Rhode Island for a visit. And then, however, in April and August of 1913, this report came in the French Intelligencer newspaper of the French Society. Abby B. Munro, the principal of the Lang, Middle, Lang Normal Industrial School of Mount Pleasant, who arrived here on June the 19th to spend the summer, died suddenly early yesterday morning at her home at 50 Franklin Street. She was in her 76th year. Heart disease was the cause of her death goes on to say, she attended the public schools here and graduated from Bristol High School and taught in the public schools here for 15 years. Believing that the change of climate would be beneficial to her health, she went to South in, 19, in 1869 and first taught at the Avery Institute in Charleston, later taking charge of the Lang School of Mount Pleasant. During her 45 four years of faithful service there, she had the pleasure of seeing the school develop from its primitive condition to one of the leading educational institutions of this kind in the South. For many years, she had been in charge of that institution. She was a member of the first congregational church of this town, possessed of a noble Christian character. She was loved by all who knew her, and her annual vacations spent in her native towns were always pleasant memories, not only to herself, but to a wide circle of friends. Her departure is keenly felt by relatives and will be a great loss to Lang School. Well, as it turned out, the initial idea was to get a white replacement for Abby Munro. However, in January of 1914, the Lang School visitor reported, quote, our new principal, Miss Antoinette O'Neill, is the native of, Char of South Carolina and was born in Charleston. She attended the Shaw Grammar School and su subsequently took a course in the Avery Institute in her native city. For one year, she taught at a public school in Charleston County. In 1889, she began teaching at the Lang School over the industrial department and has thus spent 24 years in that institution. For some time before the death of Abby D. Monroe, Miss O'Neill was vice principal of the school and took over most of the management. 
When the Pennsylvania Abolition Society assumed the management of the Lang School, Miss O'Neill was made the acting principal. And Miss O'Neill served as principal well into the early 1920s and was the first black principal of the Lang School. Now, when I was a boy, I knew elderly people who actually remembered Antoinette O'Neill, and I heard a few things about her. My own mother, who was born in 1922, she remembered Abby Monroe, excuse me, Antoinette O'Neill as a teacher. But by about, uh, about the early 2000s, all of the elders who had, quote, gone to Monroe School were dead and gone. And had it not been for the fact that the University of South Carolina has preserved the Abby Monroe papers as well as the Lang Visitor, the early years of Mount Pleasant's black the history, written history of Mount Pleasant's black community would have been would have been lost to the forever lost to the graveyards, along with the elders who now populate those graveyards. So this is what led me to write about a chapter about this in my book, True Story: Voices of Black South Carolina, for people to know about this particular early history of Mount Pleasant, along with Betty Lee Johnson's pamphlets with these interviews of the elders. But while all the elders are, who what she taught are now gone, there's one memory that stands out to me that really touches me about the subject matter. Miss Frances Saunders, who was born about a decade or so after Abby Monroe, did a presentation about Abby Monroe at Friendship AME Church, which is my home church in the Old Village. And she said something that really inspired me to learn more about Abby Monroe, which is as follows. She said that one day before she died, she would love to put, go to Bristol, Rhode Island, and put a rose on that good woman's grave on what she, for what she did to the African-American community in Mount Pleasant. Well, she didn't live to do that, but I do hope that this presentation has helped to educate you not only on Abby Monroe and what she did for the African-American community, but most importantly, how she helped the African-American community do for themselves and how the records of this African-American community has been preserved through this newspaper that is not only available at the University of South Carolina's uh, Carolinian Library, but is now available digitally online so we could know about this vanished past of Mount Pleasant's black community. My name is Damon Fordham, and I thank you for listening.